Hey, this is Flanagan Prairie, and uh, that's Ed out there. Uh, Ed uh, uh, is one of our nits from, was it last year, I guess? Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, 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 he was uh, harvesting out there with me uh, uh, in the fall, and we were harvesting uh, stiff goldenrod. And uh, uh, I got this little shot of him when he wasn't, wasn't aware of it. But we'll talk about grassland wildflowers and other nature facts, talk about mimicry, we'll even talk about shivering malls and about Project Wingspan. You know, Arkansas has uh, uh, several level one eco regions and then several sub regions beyond that. And Arkansas has 34 million acres and uh, at one time, uh, Arkansas had uh, uh, probably at least a million and a half acres of uh, prairie, uh, barrens, uh, uh, and glades, uh, and uh, uh, really only about one or two percent of those remain now. Uh, so we had this vast uh, uh, area that was that was, uh, uh, you know. Uh, available for pollinators and uh, and uh, uh, now uh, we have not very much. Most of us be converted to farmland, pasture, or put into, uh, uh, you know, pine plantations. And so we have uh, very little of our uh, original prairie left. This is a uh, map here of the original tall grass prairie in the United States. And uh, 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 you can see that the majority of it is in the Midwest, but it extends all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. In Arkansas, uh, it uh, was primarily in the River Valley uh, and then in the Grand Prairie. This is the Grand Prairie. Now, River Valley had was actually uh, had prairies all the way from Fort Smith to east of Little Rock, so it was it was really a pretty large area, and, and mostly prairie. Of course, there's also uh, these big monadnocks, uh, these mesas, uh, like, like Map Magazine and Petty Jean, and and there was all a lot of woodlands as well. But uh, a lot of it was prairie, you know, original tall grass prairie. Now in Arkansas, we also had tall grass prairie in the Northwest. Did not show it here, but uh, there were large prairies, uh, five to 10,000 acres uh, in all the way from uh, uh, west of Fayetteville, uh, all the way to Harrison, large prairies. And these prairies were, uh, 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 they were uh, limestone, and, and uh, chert prairies. That was the underlying uh, soil was was un limestone and uh, and chert up here. Uh, we also had blackland prairies, and I'll illustrate those in a minute. But they, they they were in this part of Arkansas in the far southwest, blackland prairies, and they were they were fairly extensive as well. Now, what are blackland? Blackland was formed over a fine clay, uh, by, by fine clay that over, overlay mus, mollusk shells were deposited in a shallow sea, I think it was in the Cretaceous period, not that, not that long ago. And, and you see extensive prairies uh, that were in Southwest Arkansas. Uh, these are the Blackland prairies. Uh, soil is very alkaline. Uh, it's black because of all the organic matter in it. Didn't grow trees well, and so prairie plants, the typical prairie plants establish themselves over this region. So those are the black land. Uh, uh, once encompassed uh, uh, a very large area, but only about uh, 10,000 acres remain nationally of the uh, black land prairie. One, one, it was over a million acres at one time, but only about uh, uh, 10,000 acres remain in, in, the, in the country. And in Arkansas, it's uh, 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 has one of the largest blackland prairies uh, anywhere in the country, actually. Uh, uh, there's one uh, that's, a, that's a, uh, a natural area now, and, they, and they've expanded that to over 5,000 acres, I think. 
Okay, what's unique about prairie plants? Well, prairie plants uh, have very deep roots. Uh, uh, most of them, 90% of them are perennial plants and uh, uh, they have very deep roots. In fact, a lot of them, over 80% of the plant is under the soil. And so there's immense carbon storage here. Uh, you can see the compass plant uh, has uh, uh, 15 feet uh, of, of roots typically in a prairie. Uh, 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 this is uh, one of the gay feathers. It has 15 feet of root as well. Uh, even the grasses have, have, have roots that go 10, 10 feet down or more. This is a uh, uh, big blue stem. Uh, so we have a lot of biomass storage, a lot of carbon storage in our native plants that you don't have in, 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 in uh, sod. Uh, uh, typically, uh, the, the sod in people's yards, the roots only go down a few inches. Uh, uh, so they don't have all that potential carbon storage that, that these native, uh, native prairie plants have. Now, this is uh, a glade. Uh, we talked about glades a minute ago. Uh, th this is just a chert glade or chert naviculite glade uh, in the Washtenaw Mountains. And uh, 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 this is covered with lichen. This is unusual picture that, uh, uh, that you see that just over this loose chert, these lichens have grown. And uh, we see some other native plants. Uh, see an aster here. Uh, this is a mountain mint. This is uh, probably uh, uh, a white leaf mountain mint. Uh, this is an uh, elephant's foot plant. Uh, we, we see pussy toes over here. Uh, this is a, uh, a probably a Christmas fern. So, uh, but, but that, that, that's, that's a, a glade. So glades are, are, are great places to find native plants too, but they're not a prairie. Here's another typical glade plant. Uh, this is hairy, hairy stem spiderwort. Uh, we collected spiderworks on the prairie, and this is not one we collected, but uh, uh, it, it gives you an idea that there are other spiderworts in Arkansas. Uh, this one uh, is, is common in the Washtenaw Mountains. Uh, uh, tall spiderwort is a species that we collected seed of. This is beard tongue. This is fox beard tongue. Uh, uh, this is one that we collected seed of for Project Wingspan as well. This beard tongue uh, is characterized by a diluted tube uh, in this area of the flower. Uh, part, part of the corella here is dil dilated, and that's true about this particular beard tongue. Uh, it's white, it's tall, it's about, it's, it goes to about three feet tall at the maximum, usually two to two and a half feet tall. Um, uh, but it's, it's, it's a common prairie plant. Uh, it's common where you find it. <laughs> Sometimes you don't find it for miles and miles when you're scout, scout along the highway, but uh, it's a beautiful plant. It, it's a, it, it makes a nice uh, uh, bouquet. Uh, it, it's a nice plant to have in your yard. A lot of people have it as a wildflower. Uh, it's very desirable as a wildflower in, in your, in your uh, uh, little mini prairie that you can have in your yard. Here's a close up of uh, foxglove beard tongue. That was compliments of uh, one of my sister's friends who took this picture at uh, Terra, Terra Noir Prairie down in uh, uh, southwest Arkansas, down near Arkadelphia. Uh, that, that was actually from a Blackland Prairie. This particular picture was taken from a Blackland Prairie down near Arkadelphia. This is butterfly milkweed. This is a milkweed I've had in the yard for about 25 years, and uh, it comes up, blooms every year. It's it's uh, uh, it's been pretty reliable. It's never seeded for me, unfortunately, but it, it does come up and bloom. Uh, this other plant here is actually not a milkweed. Uh, the thin leaves here. That's actually a Arkansas blue star, uh, which is another beautiful. Uh, native plant that you can have in your in your garden, uh, Arkansas blue star. But this is butterfly weed milkweed. 
It's the only orange milkweed we have. It's not quite as desirable uh, for monarchs as some of the other species. They will use it, uh, but it's not their first choice. Uh, but it is one of the uh, seeds we did collect uh, for Project Wingspan. Uh, at least we tried to collect. We actually couldn't find any seeding. Uh, we saw a lot of it, scattered it hard, could never find it seeding anywhere in Arkansas last year. Now this year it may be, it may be, it may seed well, but uh, it did not seed well. Okay, this is something I threw in, my granddaughter found, because I'd never seen these before. We found these last year on Mount Magazine. Uh, uh, this is coral fungi. Uh, uh, I've seen a lot of fungi over the years, but I've never seen coral fungi. And, and uh, just want to illustrate coral fungi to you. Uh, uh, but this is the fruity, fruity bodies of coral fungi. That's not in a prairie, that's on Mount Magazine. <laughs> okay, this guy. Uh, uh, this guy is a gal. Uh, uh, this, this frog, uh, I have a pond near the house. It's only about uh, 100, 150 feet in front of the house and it's about an acre. So it's a large pond and, and I have bullfrogs. And uh, this lady, she came up, I guess, uh, maybe during mating season, I'm not sure, but uh, somehow she found her way into this little fence, you see, that was uh, the doggy fence. And uh, uh, so Poor thing was out there and we, we managed to capture her in a bucket and, and take her back to the pond. And I ho hope she survived. You, you could tell she was kind of drying out. Her skin was getting a little dry. I don't know how long she'd been there in the doggy pen, but uh, we got her back to the pond and, and hopefully she survived it. She's a large frog. She weighed probably a pound and a half. And that's about the standard size, standard average size for a female uh, bullfrog. Yeah, when, when we took biology in high school or maybe in college, you dissected a frog and you did rana, rana pipians, which is a leopard frog. That's, that's what we did and most people did that. Uh, this is a bullfrog and, and it used to be rana catesbiana, but now they've changed it to lithobates and that's, that's, that's a little bit controversial apparently. Uh, some people like to still call it rana but uh, and, and then ran a pipians for the, for the leopard frog, which is a close relative. Now, how do we know this is a female? Uh, does it, you, may, you might want to unmute yourself and tell me if you know how this is, how this is a female. There's two ways for the bullfrog. Okay. Well, the, the way that you can tell this is a female bullfrog is her, her chin here is white rather than yellow or orange. And the male bullfrog generally has a chin that is, is yellow or orange. And the tympanum is about uh, uh, the size of the eye uh, on the female. And the male has a huge tympanum, much bigger than the eye. That's, that's, that's what I recall. So, it, uh, but anyway, I, I would guess the male uh, has a bigger tympanum uh, because uh, uh, perhaps they need to, to hear better. I'm not sure. But uh, the size of the tympanum and the fact that the, the chin is white suggests that she's a female. Litho, litho, lithobates catesbiana. Okay. Back to the prairie. Now, this is one of the species we collected. This is narrow leaf mountain mint. Uh, narrow leaf mountain mint is is common on prairies. Uh, uh, there's a lot of it uh, out in the western prairies. Uh, most people who have established pastures for many years uh, uh, have a lot of it, and and this is actually on my pasture. And this is a very dense colony of narrow leaf mountain mint. I managed to collect uh, uh, about uh, three large paper bags full <laughs> off this one colony of these seed heads and uh, when, it, when it matured. But uh, it, this is a very good uh, uh, source of, of uh, nectar for, for pollinating insects. Uh, uh, you can see them just buzzing all over it. Now you can't see any here right now, but generally there'll be butterflies and bees all over this stuff. Uh, when it's blooming. 
there's a close up of the flower and we have a butterfly. Some of you may know that butterfly, that's uh, that's gray hair streak. Uh, uh, it's a common uh, <clears throat> butterfly that you see in the spring, early summer, gray hair streak. And the flowers are typical mint flowers. You know, mints have uh, square stems and opposite leaves. And then they have this irregular flower with a, a, a larger lower part and a smaller upper part. And uh, that's a typical mint type flower. They're quite, quite attractive when you see them up close. Okay, this is spider milkweed. Uh, this is this is the milkweed with the largest flowers that grows in Arkansas. Uh, this one is really uh, great because uh, it's it's the most commonly used one for the monarch butterfly in the spring migration. So the the larva feed on this plant in the spring migration. It's the most important plant in Arkansas for spring migration. Now we ended out in. And with Project Wingspan of, of not getting this is one of our desired species. And that, that disappointed me because I knew this was really common milkweed and it would be easy to get seeds for. And then when I read it, it was the most common milkweed that is utilized by the monarch in the spring. But the Project Wingspan is a national Midwestern origin uh, organization. And uh, uh, they had to make decisions about things and they decided not to include this as, as, as a collectible species in Arkansas. But that really disappointed me because it, 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 it's, it's great. It, it's, uh, it's easy to grow. Uh, uh, seeds are uh, readily found and uh, uh, we need more of it. That's not one they chose to, to have in their, in, in their group. This is another milkweed that's in my pasture. This is a short green milkweed. Uh, and then we, then we have also tall green milkweed. So there are several green milkweeds. And, and this one uh, is, is, is also called green milkweed. In fact, it's called Asclepius viridis, which means green. But uh, you can confuse it with the other green milkweeds when you start calling it green milkweed. So most people call it spider milkweed spider milkweed because there's usually lots of spiders on it. That's why it's called spider milkweed, spider milkweed. That's short green milkweed and that's what it's called, short green milkweed. Okay, and we have one more uh, tall green milkweed also grows in the pasture and it's, it's it looks a little different, but uh, uh, it also grows in the pasture. This is one of our master naturalists in our group uh, who's associated with Project Wingspan. This is Don Hill, and uh, this is a Cherokee prairie. And uh, actually, this is on a, a prairie pimple mound. Yeah. What are prairie pimple mounds? Well, I got to the prairie, and uh, I'd never been on a prairie before, you know, a, a native uh, uh, undisturbed prairie, and I didn't know what those mounds were. I thought, well, this, who pushed that dirt up there? Well, I didn't know. but. Uh, uh, this is yellow crowned beard, which is one of the early blooming crowns. It's a beautiful plant, obviously. And, uh, uh, but he's looking at the yellow crowned beard. Uh, uh, this is pokeweed. Uh, this is yarrow. Yarrow is a plant that's native to the prairies, a good pollen source uh, early on in the season. Uh, uh, I've seen yarrow grow in central Alaska. It's just basically the same species. They call it northern yarrow up there, but it's just, it's essentially the same plant. Uh, so it's 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 a it's it has an enormous distribution uh, in in the Western Hemisphere. Okay, I'm going to show you uh, uh, prairie purple mounds here, and I want you to look at the prairie purple mounds and look at the species that are growing here. This is a drone uh, at Flanagan Prairie, and uh, uh, guys using a drone. You'll see him using the drone, and uh, you get to see, just you could just count the prairie pimple mounds. You see, there's a lot of them here.
most of that's a pale purple cone flower that you're seeing, and also some uh, uh, rough cone flowers, a yellow one. That's yarrow. Black eyed Susan on that pimple mound. Okay, what are pimple mounds? Well, pimple mounds are a, uh, a collection of soil that occurred in a much drier period, uh, around five to 7,000 years ago in the Holocene era. Uh, uh, it was much drier then, and uh, the wind blew uh, the soil. And uh, uh, in areas where where grass grew that tended to block the soil and it deposited where the grass grew. And as the grass kept growing uh, and, and, and the mound uh, presented a, a, uh, a potential blockage of the blowing uh, soil, it collected into these mounds and made prairie pimple mounds. And they were all over the river valley at one time. Uh, now, when plows came in, they 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 plowed the prairie pimple mounds to the ground, and they used levelers to knock them to the ground, and and so the prairie pimple mounds uh, are, are no longer present where the ground has been plowed. Uh, uh, this is an area. This is a Springdale, right outside of Spring, or actually in Springdale. Uh, you can see. Uh, the prairie pimple mounds, uh, they've used uh, infrared and, and you can see the prairie pimple mounds that are still present. This is, this is still original prairie here. You can see a block up here in the corner where you still see prairie pimple mounds. Everywhere else, you know, they've been obliterated completely. They're no longer present. And this represented uh, a, a prairie that was one time actually several thousand acres in size. And, uh, but this is the remnants of the prairie pimple mounds. Uh, still, still present after all these years. It's not been plowed under. Okay. Uh, now, with prairies, uh, why are prairies prairies, and why are, are are they not prairies? Well, we talked about uh, blackland prairies a few minutes ago. About why blackland prairies? It's because it, there's a dense clay layer, clay hard pan under the soil on top of the mollusk shells and that, and that made the prairies there. In Northwest Arkansas, uh, a lot of times the prairies were formed over uh, uh, limestone or chert and, and, and it was shallow soil, wasn't able to support trees very well and uh, uh, fire and other, uh, and other things caused the prairies to persist, you know, and, and, and the Native Americans burned the burn the woods uh, very frequently and burn the prairies very frequently and uh, uh, that allowed the prairies to persist. They did that for 10,000 years. Uh, and of course fire was uh, you know caused by lightning etc too as well. So it, historically in places in Arkansas uh, burned every five to eight years. Uh, uh, burned over completely every five to eight years and uh, nowadays when we suppress fire we may not see fire for 70 years. So the forest is thick there's there's no there's no uh, 
and the understory is all covered with small trees. Uh, there's no space for these native plants. Uh, uh, so we're going we're to see an increase in, in, in native plant numbers and, 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 and uh, plants for pollinators just because the, the National Forest Service is burning the forest on a regular basis. So we're going to see more native plants uh, just by that basis alone. Uh, now this is, uh, uh, the other prairies are caused, I want to say something about the Grand Prairie. The Grand Prairie one time uh, was 600,000 acres. And, and that's that prairie we, we saw uh, around Stuttgart and uh, uh, Scott, Stuttgart, in that area just east of Little Rock. That was 600,000 acres at one time. And, and that, that had a clay hard pan as well. And uh, uh, with that, uh, uh, it, it was settled slowly actually. And uh, since the soil wasn't quite as good uh, for farming and particularly cotton growing, it was settled fairly late and it was settled by uh, foreigners. A lot of Slovakians and, and Germans came in. Stuttgart is a German town. There's, there's a whole lot of uh, Slovak, you know, uh, uh, a whole lot of foreigners came and settled that because it was settled late because it was undesirable. And they actually raised cattle on it. And then at one point they decided this, this, this hard pan here, it holds water. And they realized that you could grow rice on it. So it was converted over to rice uh, because the rice uh, uh, would grow in that uh, uh, gumboy, highly organic layer on top. And then, then the water would not seep out because of that uh, uh, clay hard pan. And so that's what created, created the, 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 the Grand Prairie and what made it great for rice. And, and nowadays, there's only a few acres of the original Grand Prairie left, along Railroad Prairie and, and uh, a couple of the little tiny prairie segments they've got in that area. So that's the story of the Grand Prairie, which I didn't, didn't talk about much of that earlier, but uh, really an interesting uh, uh, story there. But uh, this is, I've got several little small native plant gardens, and I've got a, some, some big ones now, but uh, uh, these are, uh, you know, great for pollinators. This is, uh, of course, a tiger swallowtail, uh, uh, either a male tiger swallowtail or a uh, female that is uh, uh, the original color types. And we'll talk about mimicry in a few minutes, but this particular species, the females are often black uh, and the males are yellow, uh, have, have primarily yellow on tiger swallowtails. And, and it's, it's a mimicry. Uh, uh, so it's a sexual dimorphism and it's a mimicry that goes on with, 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 with tiger swallowtails. It's really interesting. So, uh, the, the sexual dimorphism related to mimicry. And we see that in several butterfly species. But uh, it's because the dark color of the female mimics uh, pipe vine swallowtail, which is poisonous to birds. It makes the birds vomit. So. Uh, uh, they learn that they don't want to attack the dark colored female. The male, though, I guess needs these, the yellow colors perhaps to attract the females. But the, the, so we have sexual dimorphism in that particular uh, uh, insect. Now, these are, uh, this is uh, uh, purple comb flower. This is pale purple comb flower. So we got, I got a bolt right there. You see, this is, the pale purple has thinner. Uh, thinner ray flowers. You know, when you're talking about a composite flower, you're talking about disc flowers and ray flowers. So this this flower has like, you know, 200 or 300 flowers in it because it's a composite flower. And th these are the disc flowers. This is a disc. And these are the rays. So the ray flower that in most species of wildflowers that are in the composite family, in the aster family, composite aster family, this central disc. Uh, has uh, uh, multiple uh, female flowers and, and the seeds come from that. Now, some of the ones in this family also have that the, 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 the central disc flowers are the sterile flowers or the male flowers and the female flowers are the ray flowers. And so uh, they'll have their seeds around the periphery here, whereas most of them will have the seeds in the center. 
but this is purple coneflower. This is pale purple coneflower. Uh, this is a black-eyed Susan. Uh, uh, this is, uh, of course, a uh, uh, butterfly milkweed. Uh, this is bee balm. Uh, this is Monarda fistulosa. This is one of the one of the seed we collect uh, for Project Wingspan. Of course, we're trying to collect this species for Project Wingspan. We do collect. Uh, Black Eyed Season for Project Wingspan. This flower back here is uh, is not blooming uh, at, the, at the time this was taken. Uh, is Arkansas Blue Star, which is a, uh, a blue star that's endemic to Arkansas and a few counties in Texas and uh, eastern Oklahoma. Uh, but it's it's called it's called Arkansas Blue Star. Oh, here's one more. Okay, this is our pistamin. This is pistamin dig digitalis. This is after it's already bloomed. These are the little seed heads. So we see we've got several seed that we collect in our in our in our uh, collection for Project Wingspan. Okay, this is uh this is not black eyed Susan. This is rough coneflower. Rough coneflower is not really coneflower. It's really a black eyed Susan, but it's it's not black. It's not the black eyed Susan. Okay. Uh, it's in that genus Redbeckia. It, it has it has a large cone. It's very prominent, and it has drooping flower, drooping ray flowers, and so it's different from black-eyed Susan in that respect. Now there may be some smaller black-eyed Susans down here, mixed in with the with the uh, 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 Redbeckia grandiflora or rough coneflower. Now with rough coneflower, instead of having like black-eyed Susan might be branched and it might have 20 flowers at one time. Rough, rough, rough cone flower usually has one, one flower per stalk, one flower per plant. This is rough cone flower. Now back in the back here, we see a uh, 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 pale purple cone flower. We don't see a lot of regular uh, purple cone flower on the prairies. It's usually pale purple cone flower. Uh, almost always pale purple coneflower on the prairies and not purple coneflower. This is a, a apparently a mound. This is this is this is I think we're starting to see this this may be that same mound the guy took in the picture where there's a whole lot of a black eyed Susan on the on the prairie pimple mound. Okay. Now we do a lot of our collecting on the roadside probably the majority of our collecting on roadside. Uh, and this is a typical roadside scene. Now, th th this is a little more dense in, in, in collectible plants than you typically see, but uh, uh, we have several here. Uh, uh, we have, uh, looks like a, uh, a fritillary is working. This is a, a Great Spangle Fritillary. Uh, we have Black-eyed Susan. Uh, we have uh, we have Bee Balm, uh, Monarda fistulosa here, large. Now, see this benefits from moisture uh, and also from a fertilized field nearby. So right behind there is a hay meadow, and the guy treats his hay meadow with fertilizer or or, or chicken chicken litter. So these, this fertilizer seeps out uh, uh, from the, the adjacent fields and fertilizes this. So these, these plants are much more vigorous than you typically see in a prairie. Uh, much bigger, much taller, uh, a lot more seed available, really. Uh, so this, this is a roadside. Now we see some invasive plants here. Uh, this is in the spring or early summer, so we know this is not uh, a big blue stem or another great prairie plant, this is actually tall fescue. And tall fescue is, is uh, aleopathic, which means it, its roots are poisonous to other plants. And, uh, and so tall fescue limits a lot of plants. And tall fescue limits quail production and quail populations. It's so thick that quails can't live in it. So uh, 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 tall fescue is a really bad plant and it's all over the country. And uh, uh, you know, and it's very difficult to get rid of. You have to use Roundup on tall fescue to get rid of it. 
unfortunately. This is a little daisy. Uh, uh, this is a common little daisy we'll see in Arkansas. Uh, genus Erigeron. Uh, uh, they're more prettier daisies, but that's actually really nice. Okay. This is the species that Project Wingspan wanted us to collect uh, in addition to butterfly milkweed. It's called whirl milkweed. Uh, it's, it's, it's probably common in a lot of prairies, but it's not common in Arkansas. Now we, we found it a couple of places, but we never could find sufficient seed. Uh, this is at uh, Camp Robinson Special Use Area. Uh, this is whirl milkweed and uh, it has leaves very much uh, like uh, 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 the uh, narrow leaf mountain mint you saw earlier. It has a typical milkweed flower. Milkweed flowers are very specialized. Uh, uh, they, they, they are specialized uh, to, to permit certain pollinators. Uh, uh, they're very specialized flower. I won't get into to that because I, 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 I'd quote something wrong on that, but uh, I can tell you this, they're a, they're a unique flower. Okay, uh, now what do we do with all these flowers? This is uh, tall spiderwort, and uh, we debate about how to collect tall spiderwort. You know, uh, I'll show you tall. Let's see, let's see, I probably have some other space tall, tall spiderwort somewhere, but I think I do. Not. But anyway, we, we ended up pulling the heads off after the flowers had bloomed. There were two recommendations that came about uh, from my reading. One was to shake the head and see what seed you could get. You might get three or four seed. Uh, the other was to place a bag uh, over the seed and come back in a few days and check and see if the seed had fallen out. Well, that, that, that's not going to work when you're trying to collect enough seed to, 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 uh, to uh, you know, uh, basically uh, renovate, you know, hundreds of acres. So. Uh, we found it best to go ahead and pick the seed heads off with a, a pair of uh, loppers and, and uh, bring them in, put them on a table to dry and add a fan over here on the left that would blow uh, air over the seeds, seed heads and they eventually dried out about four days. Uh, I collect the seed every day off these and uh, after about four days, uh, uh, the seed were uh, essentially uh, released from the seed heads. And uh, this is this, I, I learned quickly that this was a mess. I didn't want to do this. I, I brought seed into the house. Uh, and, 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 and these are the fluffy seed with uh, these seed have uh, pappus. Okay, the pappus is the little aerial parachute like portion. So it's, you think of dandelion. Okay, dandelion is a classic pappus seed, okay? Not all seed from this family have pappus, okay? Obviously, coneflowers do not. Uh, Black-eyed Susan do not have pappus, but a lot of these seeds do. You know, asters have pappus. Uh, bone set has pappus. Uh, uh, Iron weeds have pappus. So there's, that, that obviously allows dispersal of seed. Another one that has pappus is uh, 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 Goldenrod, you know, has pappus. So the, the pappus allows for long distribution. They, they, they can blow for miles on a, on a windy day. And, and so it, the, the, those plants have an advantage, don't they, in terms of their, uh, their reproduction and seed dispersal, because they've got this pappus that allows it to, to blow off and to uh, carry the seed with it for long distances. But you don't want to bring this pappus in the house. I learned that quickly. Project Wingspan said, cut them off in the bag and bring them home. No, don't do that. What I found out was best to take a paper bag out into the field, uh, lower the plant stem with the, with the seeds on it and brush and pluck them like you're plucking a chicken. And uh, so when your seed get, get uh, 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 you get all your seeds, they're basically ready to ship, they're already dry. And uh, and you can ship them out rather quickly. You don't you don't need any long drying process for those seed, and you don't make a mess inside your house. 
a lot of mess on the table. See, I, I, I collected seed for myself last year too, because I'm, I'm seeding several acres of wildflower seed. And uh, uh, this back here is Rattlesnake Master. Uh, there's a comb flower. Uh, I utilize these little, uh, I had my pharmacist, I got a relationship with a pharmacist and he collected these little uh, uh, silicon, uh, silicate uh, uh, capsules and, and little bags of silicate for me, which are drying agent, you know, and they, they, they come in, uh, uh, they come in uh, uh, big bottles of, of pills and they collected hundreds of these for me. And so I, I put these in, in the container and we close the container out tight and put it in the refrigerator. And if you use that silicate and you keep your, your seeds in a refrigerator and you keep the moisture level below 40%, uh, relative humidity below 40%, seeds will keep for uh, 10 to 15 years in those conditions. So you can keep your seed a long time. If you leave your seed uh, in, in room temperature and without any kind of drying agent, uh, you know, they, they, they will lose their viability fairly quickly. Okay. This is uh, one called ashy sunflower. Uh, this is not one we collected. Uh, it's one that uh, has similarities to another species. I'll show you a few minutes. But th this is ashy sunflower. I believe this is Camp Robinson Special Use Area. Uh, it's a beautiful sunflower. Uh, this is Black Eyed Susan growing right along with Black Eyed Susan. Uh, this down here is Rattlesnake Master. We'll show, I'll show you that more later. That's Rattlesnake Master. Uh, it was used by Native Americans uh, as, a, as a poultice for rattlesnake bites. Of course, it didn't do any good, but that's how I got its name, Rattlesnake Master. Interesting plant, beautiful plant. This is, uh, down here is uh, uh, wild petunia. And we've got about four species of wild petunias in Arkansas. That's not a plant at all, is it? I was having to find him when I was working with my plants and I took a picture of him. Of course, that's a brown recluse. If you got an old house like we did, we've been here for 32 years or 33 years. Uh, we've got got these dudes in every crevice and corner, so you have to put out those little traps for them. But occasionally, I'll I'll, I'll take a picture of one. <laughs> and this is a brown recluse, and it, of course, it's a base of bad spider. Uh, there's this little violin on top of his uh, cephalothorax. He has a violin. And that's how you recognize him. He's anywhere from light gray to a fairly dark brown. He's always got this violin. His, his, his feet always face forward like that. They're very awkward walking spiders. Uh, very, very awkward looking with those long legs. But they can cause a lot of skin damage. And, uh, and they can be fatal in certain situations. I've seen patients uh, pretty ill with this uh, spider bite. Brown recluse. Okay, we talked about roadsides. Uh, with respect to roadsides, uh, this uh, is roadside near Moreland. And uh, what we're seeing here is uh, another plant I wish we had collected. Uh, we see black eyed Susans, and we did collect black eyed Susans from this spot. Now, there's some question about whether we'll be able to collect black eyed Susans from roadsides anymore in Arkansas because apparently the Arkansas Department of Transportation seeds these particular plants. And uh, 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 we worry about getting uh, seed of the wrong ecotype. For instance, if they got their seed from Southern Illinois, you know, we're not looking for seed from Southern Illinois, we're looking for native seed from Arkansas. So we, we're real concerned if the DOT seeds these areas because uh, they, can, they can bring in uh, non eco type plants. Now, th this plant here is a wonderful plant. Uh, uh, this is a uh, 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 giant, uh, okay, okay, I got blocking in the name of it right now, but uh, uh, it's Circeum. Circeum uh, is a species, a genus, but uh, it's thistle, giant thistle, yeah. It's tall thistle or giant thistle, tall thistle. Anyway, 
you can see great numbers of it. It goes all the way up the hillside. And uh, unfortunately, Project Wingspan stuck us with getting collecting one called, uh, uh, it's another thistle, Circium, different, different species. Well, that particular species doesn't occur in Arkansas except in what, like one or two counties uh, on Crowley's Ridge. It didn't occur anywhere else in Arkansas. So, but we've got all this great tall thistle, just enormous amounts of it that we could collect. And, and you, you see it, the, the, typically the, the, the pollinators are covering it. Now today, they, this particular day, I took a picture, I don't see any butterflies, but typically there'd be butterflies and bees all over it, you know, and it's really desirable. And it's really easy to find and, and not too hard to collect and dry and, and, and prepare seeds. And, but, but that's the thistle they chose not to have us collect, even though we don't essentially don't have the other one in Arkansas. So uh, I, I wish that we would we were collecting this species instead. This is tall thistle and it's a wonderful uh, uh, species for pollinators. It's either a biennial or, or an annual. It's not a perennial, but it reseeds really well. And I've got it in my pasture tall thistle. It's black. Uh, black eyed Susan, th th these are th this is the this is a disc and these are the ray flowers out here. We have a scarabee beetle, scarabead beetle attacking it and you can see where it's probably the scarabead beetle has, has eaten the base of the flowers here. Uh, there are more than 300,000 species of beetles worldwide. It's the most common uh, 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 order uh, or suborder, order of the all, uh, all insects is, are the beetles, coleoptera. Black eyed Susan again. And uh, this little dude here is, is a little pollinator. Uh, uh, this is uh, dainty sulfur. Dainty sulfur on black eyed Susan. It's our smallest sulfur butterfly. Sulfurs are yellow butterflies. They're related to cabbage butterflies. Uh, they're a native species. This is another gray hair streak. Uh, this is on same species. There's a little beetle down here working it. Okay, there's a prairie pyramid mound, and we, we saw earlier the guy with his 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 drone, and he, he we, we saw actually this prairie pyramid mound as he came by with his drone. But this is in the spring when the black eyed Susans are blooming, and back back here you can see the pale purple crumb, the purple of the pale purple crumb flowers back here, and the yellow of the uh, of the uh, uh, rough cone flower. This is a uh, Pokeweed. Pokeweed is a common Arkansas weed. Uh, it, it, its fruits are actually good bird food. So, and people eat it. I don't know if you've ever had poke salad or not, but that's what poke salad comes from. It's traditional uh, uh, spring astringent in Arkansas. It'll uh, if, if you've got constipation problems, it'll definitely get you going. You know. You have to boil the water a couple times, parboil it because it's got po it's poisonous and it'll, it'll make you have really bad diarrhea. But if you boil it a couple times and sometimes mix it with gre other greens, it's, a, it's really good. Pork salad. Yeah, this, this, this episode cover, you can see this would be a great resource for black eyed Susan seeds. And these are proper ecotype. I mean, they've been on that prairie there for hundreds of years. So these, these are not going to be. Uh, uh, some ecotype that came from Southern Illinois or Central Indiana, you know, they're going to be, it's going to be a, a, an Arkansas ecotype. So we really want to try to hit Camp Robinson special use area more for Black Eyed Susans in the Western Prairies for Black Eyed Susans. What's that? That's a dung roller. That's genus Canthon uh, and it's on switchgrass. Uh, what's a dung roller doing on switchgrass? I don't know. It, typically, that's not where he's going to be. What does a dung roller eat? Well, a dung roller eats dung. And uh, uh, have have you guys ever seen a dung roller working? Uh, I should have gotten a video of one of those because it's cool. Uh, 
they use their hind legs to push the dung, little dung ball. They make the ball, they, they form it into the ball. And frequently the, the male and female will cooperate on this. And then they use their hind legs to push the ball. They hold the ball with their hind legs and they push with their forelegs. And it's kind of it's kind of fun to watch a, a dung roller. I, I hadn't seen one since I was a kid as far as you seeing one active, but I, I did find this one on switchgrass and it was cool to, 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 to find dung roller. I hadn't seen one in years. I was out in the prairie when I saw this uh, dung roller. Okay, now we talked about tall spiderwort earlier. Y'all saw the collection on the table where, where we cut the heads off, and and uh, and basically this is this is we have some areas here on Highway 22. I mean, I, I we looked all over for tall spiderwort. We went to the prairies first to try to find tall spider, but but we were on the way to the prairies. We saw scattered of it in three areas. In the prairie, we found it about every every hundred feet. You'd find one spiderwort plant. Well, you you don't want to harvest seeds because you're just not. You don't want to take the seeds out of the prairie when you're not finding a lot of it, for one thing. And so we, but we did find it on Highway 22, and it was in areas where there were fertilized fields next to the road. Okay, so you had, you had uh, uh, it it being mowed once per year now. In the last 20 years or so, the Arkansas Highway Department just uh, uh, cuts an eight foot section off uh, in June and July, sometimes in May as well. But they don't cut the rest of it off. And typically there's another 20 to 30 feet of, of right of way on most state highways. So they leave that for wildflowers. And uh, and that has been their policy now for several years. Of course, it cuts down their need for equipment and gas and, and, and labor by leaving that. So they don't cut that until November, okay? And so you, you'll see all these uh, uh, mowing machines out in November really cutting hard uh, because that's when they, that's, that's when they cut that, that last you know, 20, 30 feet of right away. Well, that's where you're gonna find your wildflowers. And so it's an ideal situation because the wildflowers grow there uh, and then, then all the shrubs and trees and anything that are trying to grow, you know, get cut down in the fall. And, uh, and, and the tall grass gets cut down in the fall. So it allows us in these, these, these wildflowers to flourish. And uh, if they're adjacent to, to, to nearby fields, you can get uh, 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 the fertilizer coming in. And uh, uh, it, if there's a lot of moisture, a species like this will thrive. And we found uh, particularly one set, we found three sections that were really good. One section was a quarter mile long, and of course, you know, 30 feet deep and, and uh, uh, was extremely dense in these, these species, you know, the, the most dense you could ever imagine. Now, I, I've traveled a lot over 50, uh, over our counties looking for this species, but I just didn't find much of it anywhere except those three places. And, it's, and, it, and it, we were really fortunate, you know, that we were able to get that because we were able to harvest. After drying and cleaning, we had over half a pound of these seeds and, and uh, uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, 10,000 seeds per ounce. So that's a lot of seed, you know. There's the flower of tall spider. What's this? It can be a really beautiful sky blue. It can have a little bit of purple in it, but it's not as purple as the other species. Like we saw earlier, I showed you that hairy spiderwort. It was really purple. This this one's almost pure blue, generally. Tall spiderwort. It's also called Ohio spiderwort. Little hairy stamens here. Uh, little hairy. Uh, yeah, and uh, the anthers are nice yellow. This is a uh, tall spiderwort in a uh, woodland situation. This is growing out of a, 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 a rock, crack in the rock, uh, on, actually on the Washita Trail in a woodland situation. So it can grow, it's flexible enough that it can grow in a woodland situation quite well, even though it's more common in uh, open situations. 
there's a seed of tall spiderwort. Eight, eight to 12,000 seeds per ounce. One source said 12,000 seeds per ounce. One source said 8,000. I, I, would, I would lean to 10 to 12, really. I think it's not that big, but they're unique little seeds. They're, they're, they're kind of shaped like an arrow, and they have this little, uh, little target on one side of them, a little round target in the seed. And, and you could see the microscope is really well detailed, but that's uh, tall spiderwort. And at, at, at 10,000 seeds per ounce, that was one of our bigger seeds. This is an interesting story. Uh, this is naked stem sunflower on Highway 7. Uh, I was scouting out scouting and I saw these sunflowers blooming. And I thought, gee, this is beautiful. And I don't know what this sunflower is. It had these beautiful uh, burgundy red stems and, 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 and really pretty flowers. Uh, they're about an inch and a half across. A lot of flowers are a huge stand of these, you know. It's called naked stem sunflower because it has no leaves on the stems. It's essentially, essentially no leaves on the stems. It has a few maybe, but, but basically it comes up from the base and shoots way up about, about three feet and then flowers. And, uh, and this naked stem sunflower. I didn't know what it was. I went to the books and I said, well, it's gotta be either of these two species. It's gotta be, it's gotta be western sunflower or naked stem sunflower. And so I emailed the picture and, and, and both of those were rare in the area. And, and, and I emailed the picture to the, my friend at uh, Arkansas uh, Natural Heritage Commission and uh, I worked with him before in uh, 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 named Brent Baker. Uh, he's from Darnell. And uh, he, uh, he said, yes, this, where do you find this? I said, yeah, I, I found it there on Highway 7. He said, well, that's, we've not found that plant before. We've only found like three uh, colonies of this over the state, you know, three or four. And uh, they've been small and we've not found it there before said, you found a new county for this specimen. Tell me exactly where it is and, and I'll go out and uh, we'll tag it and we'll, we, we will, we will connect, collect genetic studies on this plan. And, uh, and so I told him exactly where it was and, uh, and he, they went out and, and, and it said, what's well, a new source, a new county for this particular uh, subspecies of, of Western, Western uh, sunflower called uh, naked stem sunflower. So that was cool I, that I got to do that. I found a new, a, new, a new plant, naked stem sunflower. I love sunflowers. I, I collected sunflower seed, uh, a lot of them, and I'll, I'll show you some the results of that in a little while. Okay, there's our benefactor that we're working for with Project Wingspan. Uh, uh, it's a monarch butterfly, and that's in, in my yard. Uh, this is on uh, aromatic aster. Aromatic aster is a nice little aster that you can, you can get for your native plant garden. It does real well. Uh, it is a native of Arkansas. Uh, I see it growing up on Mount Magazine. Uh, if you go up Mount Magazine on the south side, about halfway up, there's a, a real wet uh, uh, cliff, and it's growing out of the cracks in the cliff there, uh, aromatic aster. You don't find it on prairies, though. Okay, we see several things going on here. Uh, we see something back here, don't we? We see some little tiny red bugs here. Okay. Now, this plant is a plant I've already shown you. This is the mature form. We, we saw it earlier. This is this is uh, the milkweed that I said was uh, the most common one for spring migration uh, utilization by the monarch larva. So this is a monarch larva, okay? This little red bug here is a problem. It's a problem for Project Wingspan. Uh, uh, this is a migratory bug, bug called uh, milkweed bug. And uh, uh, this is the larva, the tiny larva that are growing here. They grow pretty fast and uh, once this capsule starts to split open, these the adult bugs go in, and the, the larvae do too, and they destroy the seed inside. They they have a proboscis because they're a true bug, and they, they'll suck the 
suck the center of the seed out, the, the sap in the center of the seed and kill the seed. So we have to be aware of prodigal wingspan of these dudes because they will uh, destroy the seed. So, so once the seed cracks open, we can't utilize it, especially if there's any, any you see any of the bugs around. That may be an adult bug right back here. It's this, we can see the orange of it. That's probably the adult bug. I didn't get it. It's not in focus, but that's probably the adult bug. But this is this is the spider milkweed uh, uh, with weed bugs and with a monarch larva. This is actually the fall migration. Uh, the reason this is growing so vigorously in the fall rather than the spring is that uh, the people that the man who cuts the hay on the pasture here at the house he cuts it in july so these things come back vigorously and and will will, will flower and fruit again in the fall so this this is actually the fall migration of the monarch and it, but typically they utilize this this species in the spring in arkansas but these are typical milkweed fruits here there's the larva Oh, she's got yellow and white and black stripes. We'll see another larva in a few minutes that mimic, mimics him. We've been at it about an hour. Uh, let's see where I am here. Yeah, you want you want to take a break for a few minutes. Yeah, it's time. You guys need to have a break. How about how many minutes you want to break for? This is not one of our routine collection plants, but it's a wonderful native Arkansas plant. Uh, you notice that 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 is a black-eyed Susan, right? Yeah. It is a black-eyed Susan. It's, it's the same genus Rudbeckia. It looks very much like a black-eyed Susan. Uh, uh, but this is called sweet comb flower. This is a perennial. Black-eyed Susan is an is a annual or short-lived perennial. Black-eyed Susans will live a couple of years sometimes. Sometimes they'll, they will die, you know, after they bloom. Uh, uh, so black-eyed Susan is not a reliable perennial, but this one is. This is sweet comb flower. Uh, this is a wonderful native plant. It's called sweet coneflower because it smells like anise. Okay, if you if if you crush the seed heads or you crush the leaves, it smells like anise. It's a wonderful wonderful fragrance, and it gets to be a large coneflower. You can see there, it's 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 three or four three feet tall, and, and this was been there several years, so it's got multiple trunks. It's in a moist area, uh, uh, actually in a high place. Uh, I don't know if you all know where uh, Max Pines is up on Highway 7. Uh, this particular coneflower was near Max, uh, Max Pines. And uh, uh, I found it and I came back later and harvested seed for, seed heads from it. And they're growing out now. Uh, they're, they're one of my last ones to come up, but they're coming up. And so I'm excited about getting sweet coneflower up. But, it's, it's a wonderful native plant. If you have, an ex, have a chance to get sweet cone flower and you've got a, a sort of a moist place, it's, it's really, really great. And it'll grow in dry garden soil too, but it won't grow on a, it won't go on a dry, dry rocky glade, but it'll go in ordinary gar garden soil as well. It's, it's a wonderful plant. Highly recommend it as a native plant, sweet cone flower. Now see that one difference is these trilobed leaves, okay? That is, the typical leaf of sweet coneflower as opposed to uh, black-eyed Susan, which has uh, a single simple leaf. It doesn't have this trilobe leaf. Okay, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about mimicry now, I think. Uh, this is one common Arkansas butterfly. You've all seen it. This is a red spider purple. Uh, uh, if you go up north, this same species has a whole different color pattern. 
uh, uh, the color patterns. White is called a white admiral. If you go to Kentucky or you go to Ohio or, or, or Michigan, you're going to see white admirals. If you go out west uh, to Colorado, you'll see white admirals, but you won't see red spotted purples. Uh, but it's the same species, exactly the same species. But in the south, they've evolved from mimicry. Uh, uh, they, they, they mimic the pipe vine swallowtail. We talked about the pipe vine swallowtail a little bit earlier. A lot of things mimic the pipe vine swallowtail because the, the pipe, pipe vine swallowtail is toxic to birds. Okay. So this is one species that mimics that pipe vine swallowtail. And I'll, show, I'll show you a picture of pipe, pipe vine swallowtail in a minute. Uh, but that, that, that's the red spotted purple. Wonderful, beautiful butterfly, very common in Arkansas. Uh, I remember one time driving to, to Hot Springs and uh, the cancer weed, which is a, a, a native mint that grows along the side of the road, was really uh, in bloom. And there were thousands of these things out there, thousands upon thousands of red spotted purples. And when I got home, I had so many in my grill, I had to sh sh scrape them off the grill of the car. You, you know, you, could, you couldn't avoid them. And, uh, uh, but I'd never seen as many red spotted purples. And they were feeding on that cancer weed there along uh, 7 South down the scenic highway toward Hot Springs. Okay, what does this larva mimic? This is a red spotted purple larva, okay. What does it mimic? Does anybody know if anybody want to unmute themselves and tell me what you think that is, what that's mimicking? Anybody know? No. Nope. How about bird shit? <laughs> bird shit. It mimics bird shit. So the red spotted purple mimics bird shit. And, and, and your typical bird's not going to want to eat its own shit, is it? So actually, that's what it, it, it bird bird droppings. That mimics a bird dropping. And, and that's the red spotted purple's larva. Okay. Now here's another larva that I'm going to show you next. That if you notice, it does the same thing. Okay. It also mimics bird droppings, but it's uh, uh, not the same species. Oh, that looks like a bird dropping, doesn't it? Okay. Now this is on. Uh, 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 a little native member of the citrus family. And uh, this particular species feeds on members of the citrus family. Uh, you can see here that it, it does look like bird droppings. It has these two big eye-like structures here. So it's pretty frightening looking. And uh, it even has one other way that it uh, expresses itself. If you get too close, there's your snake tongue coming out. Coming out. <laughs> so the, he has not only not only the, the the pattern of bird droppings, but he also has a snake tongue that he can throw at you if you get too close. So this uh, is the giant swallowtail larva. Okay. The giants, and it's a common, you've seen giant swallowtails, whether you know it or not, they're, they're in your yard, you know, and they're beautiful butterfly. They're the largest of swallowtails. Wingspan up to about five inches across sometimes. They're the largest, they're the, actually the, probably the largest native butterfly. Now there's moths that are bigger, but that's probably the largest native butterfly we have is giant swallowtail. And, and the, 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 uh, it feeds on members of the citrus family. And this is one of those members here, this little tree here, is common along uh, uh, ridges and washtals and uh, some of the Ozarks, I suspect, but I've seen it a lot uh, uh, on the high ridges and the washtals. Uh, this is uh, Telia trifolia, uh, but it's it's a uh, it's con I can't think of the common name right now, but uh, it's a, it's an interesting little plant and a hop tree. It's American hop tree. Okay, it's, it's, it's called American hop tree because the fruits look like a hop. Look like hops they make beer with. That's American hop tree, Telia trifolia, and it is in the citrus family. And the the this particular larva only feeds on members of the citrus family. I've also seen it on prickly ash, which is a member of the citrus family, uh, Xanthozylum 
Americanum, uh, or Xanthodon Hercules clavis also, there's two, two species of the prickly ash in Arkansas. But it'll be on them and it'll be on uh, Telia, which is American hop tree. Giant swallowtail. Okay. Now we saw earlier, we saw this uh, yellow and black and and so what what kind of larva is that mimicking? Anybody know what, what we saw earlier larva wise that had that sort of similar color pattern? Monarchs. You wanna unmute yourself? Monarch, okay. Are these monarchs? I'll give you a hint, they're not feeding on they're not feeding on on, on milkweed, okay? They're feeding no. on parsley, okay? They're black swallowtails, okay? These are black they're swallowtail like larvae. Yeah. Okay, these are black swallowtail larvae and they 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 mimic the 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 uh, 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 larvae that grow milkweed which 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 is monarch larvae. Monarch larvae are toxic to birds. These are not toxic to birds, but they get the benefit of mimicking the mimic mimicry and the birds learn this is a learned behavior birds learn that these that these look like monarchs and birds have learned that monarchs are poisonous to them so they make them sick and uh, uh, so they do not uh, uh, eat the uh, black swallowtail larva another another mimicry Okay, we talked about pot vine swallowtails. Now, this is not a pot vine swallowtail. It's a red spotted purple. You saw that earlier. Now, these are probably pot vine swallowtails. They might not be pot, pot vine swallowtails. I'm pretty sure they are actually, but they could be the female form of the tiger over here. So they could be female tigers, which mimic pot vine swallowtails, or they may be pot vine swallowtails. I, I think they're pot vine swallowtails, but I'm not, I'd, I'd have to go back and look at, and I actually hadn't hadn't looked at the fine detail, but I think they're pot vine swallowtails. But see, the, the mimicry is illustrated quite well here. Okay, uh, this is one of our target plants, of course, bee balm. We have a large population on Mount Magazine of bee balm. And uh, this is a great spangle for Larry Fino Mount Magazine. Uh, this is uh, uh, down near the Benefield picnic area. Uh, we've actually got a permit this year to collect there. Uh, we may actually collect there. I would like to get some of this bee balm. Now, the question is, is a bee balm that grows at 2,800 feet or 2,700 feet, maybe, maybe 2,550 or so at Benefield, is it going to be viable down in the river valley uh, where the elevation is? Because it, it, it's 10 degrees cooler up here in the summertime. Is it going to be viable down there? Are they the same ecotype, even though they're within not very far distance of each other? Is the elevation going to make it less likely to survive uh, in the river valley if we plant it there? I don't know. You know, I don't know. We do have permits to collect it. Obviously we have mixed seed, so we will be mixing seed throughout the river valley. We know that if we include this seed, uh, that they might plant it at a higher elevation, for instance, and it, it, then it would be more likely to compete and survive. So there's a lot of ecotype questions here going on about collecting this particular species for, for project wingspan, because most of it's gonna be planted at, at lower elevations, less than 500 feet. So uh, is there gonna be a problem? Uh, well, if you mix your seed, maybe not, uh, uh, and they are mixed seeds. So they're all mixed once they, once they get to the nursery, uh, they're all mixed from our collection. So uh, we may well collect there and we could get a lot, you know, uh, uh, up there on, up, up on Mount Magazine. This is also a Mount Magazine. Uh, uh, this is a bomb. Now this particular bee bomb is, it grows on Mount Magazine is the same species, Monarchificulosa, but it tends to be white rather than the light, light uh, lavender that the other species, the other the other uh, ecotypes have. So it tends to be white, and, and I've seen also this white when growing in the Washtals. Uh, 
at, at less than 800 feet elevation as well. But there are six species of bee bomb in Arkansas. This is my artificialosa at, at lower elevations. Uh, this, is, this is still moderately high elevation. This is probably about uh, uh, 1,600 feet up above. Uh, now, this particular one, no, I'm, I take that back. I'm sorry. I think this is actually one that grew uh, at Flanagan Prairie, which would be at about 500 feet elevation or so, 500 feet elevation. But this is the light purple light lavender, typical ecotype we see in River Valley. This is it after it bloomed. Now these plants are particularly vigorous because they're in a very fertilized area and, uh, and they're very, very colorful and very, very large uh, seed heads. Uh, but this is the same species we just saw. This is after it bloomed, it's, it's not reached maturity yet. It won't reach maturity until the seed head dries out then it's re reached maturity. Now, these seed do not disperse after they reach maturity. They don't disperse until the, the winter, uh, or late fall, early winter, when they begin to fall apart. Now, uh, with, the, with the seed head, you notice that each one of these little uh, florets in here in the, in the, in the large flower, uh, the opening is occluded uh, and after the seeds mature, the opening still occluded for a long time. It'll begin to open up uh, uh, in the fall as seed head begins to fall apart and the seed can fall out. But you can actually, uh, once the seed dries out, you can take a pair of shears and trim the edge of this and dump the seed out. And you get up to 100, 125 seed per seed head if you do that. So, but you gotta take a fine pair of shears and cut the tips off all these little florets or little, little ovaries that are left in the flower and the seed will fall out. There's no other way to get them out really. Now this is, looks like that species, doesn't it? See something different though? This species has little purple dots, okay? This is this is this is either Monarda breadberryana, I believe. This is breadberryana. You know, this is fishulosa. This is breadberryana. Breadberryana is tends to be a more forest species. You can see it sometimes uh, in in open areas, but it tends to be uh, like a little bit of shade sometimes. But this is Monarda breadberry. It's a different species than that previous one we just saw. And yet here's another different species. Now see the difference between these two. These both have little purple dots, don't they? If you look closely, the top petal on this species is attached to the stamens and pistil, okay? And you can see that the pistil parts sticking out here for the, for the pollinators to work with. On this species, the top petal is reflected completely. It falls back and allows the the anthers and and uh, uh, pistol to be exposed completely. So you see uh, this one, the top petal encloses the the sexual reproductive parts. This one, it encloses sexual reproductive parts, and this one, the sexual reproductive parts are exposed. This is Madara russelliana. This is definitely a, a woodland species. You do not see this one out open hardly at all. I mean, I think you go find your garden if it's open, but uh, it prefers, in nature, it prefers to compete in a woodland setting. So this is a third uh, fairly common uh, uh, bee bomb that grows in Arkansas. Okay. Now, stiff goldenrod, uh, they're pretty small seed, 41,000 seeds per ounce. Uh, that's not the smallest we've encountered. Uh, we worked with one that had 375,000 seeds per ounce. That's really small. But stiff goldenrod is, uh, we only found it on Flanagan Prairie. We didn't find it any other place. I've never seen that plant in any other place. Uh, it is a specific prairie plant. And uh, it's not survived on roadsides like many other species have. 
it doesn't adapt well to that kind of situation. And we've only found stiff golden rod on Flanagan Prairie. And it's, it's abundant there. And we were able to collect it. And that is one of our collectible species that we have in for Project Wingspan, stiff golden rod. There it is almost mature, uh, not quite mature. Uh, this little bit out of focus, but uh, in about a week, it'll be easy to strip these off uh, by putting the bag, the bag method where you grab the seed and pluck them off. And that's much better than taking a plant home. Uh, just pluck them off and you'll get the mature seed that way and you'll leave the immature seed to, to go ahead and mature. Little guy, this is a neat picture I took a number of years ago. This little guy was uh, hiding from us on a hike on uh, uh, Mount Nebo, and uh, uh, we spotted him. And and I mean, you walk right up to him. He was he was just as still as he could be. And uh, he or she, I don't know which one, but. Uh, Cute little guy. Okay, 14 species of milkweeds in Arkansas. Uh, and I would imagine that, that most of them are utilized at least somewhat by uh, the monarch butterfly and its migration. This is a, a common Arkansas milkweed usually found in, in uh, a kind of savanna type environment or on glades. Uh, it's, it's Going to be in open woods. You're not going to see this species uh, very much uh, on prairies or roadsides. It likes some shade. It is our most beautiful milkweed species, I think. Uh, it's, it's got wonderful, beautiful leaves. They're big and they're dark green. And the flower is white with shades of, of purple. Uh, this is called variegated milkweed. Uh, uh, that's commonly called variegated milkweed. This is one of the ones we had on our list. Now, I really like this plant, and I think you'd like it too. Uh, this is this is button button gay feather, also called rough gay feather. It's called rough gay feather because it's it's uh, it's pretty hairy, but it also has uh, reflexed filaries. Okay, now by the filary, that's in a composite plant in the aster family, these bracts on the outside of the floret, floret or on the outside of the flower <clears throat> are called filaries. And it has, re this particular species has reflexed filaries. And that's how you know you're dealing with this. Of course, it's pretty unique in the gay feather in that the, the feathers are, I mean, the flowers are fairly large, the, 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 the florets are fairly large and, the, and they're separated. But uh, in this plant, is unique in, in, among the, the, the gay feathers and it grows in really dry environments. Now, there are the, some other gay feathers growing in dry environments too, but this one is a, sort of a glade plant. It does grow on some of the prairies. I think they have it at Chesney Prairie, but we did, we did we, up in Northwest Arkansas, but we did not find this at either Flanagan uh, or Cherokee Prairie. And, but I do find on roadsides and uh, I found this plant it was one of our desirable plants, one of the ones we were supposed to collect. But I found it in such rugged environments that I felt like it was uh, very, very difficult, difficult to collect. I didn't, I didn't want my team to be collecting on those steep, rocky environments where we found this plant. Now, uh, this particular plant is, is growing on a fairly, uh, it's going on a hillside, and a an, dry hillside, uh, and it wasn't too ste steep to, to walk up to. But usually those things are growing on really dangerous, steep areas in Arkansas, but it is, was on our list. We didn't get enough. To, I never found a collect, enough to collect that I thought was safe in a place that I thought was safe to collect. It's a wonderful gay feather. Uh, if you have an opportunity to get it for your garden, it's great. There it is again, uh, rough or button gay feather. Again, a species that we, we just couldn't find enough to collect. Okay. There's Flanagan Prairie, Flanagan Prairie Natural Area. Now, have you guys been uh, told about natural areas? Or are you familiar with them? Uh, there, there's 
uh, at least 71, as of last year, 71 natural areas in the state of Arkansas. They are uh, administered by the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission. Uh, they generally represent uh, either some historical, like Darnell Rock, uh, which is a, a, a large rock formation on the Arkansas River that was important for navigation. But more commonly, they represent attempts to uh, save parts of Arkansas habitats. Okay, that's what that's what natural areas are for. This one obviously is Flanagan Prairie. It's saving a prairie habitat. Uh, railroad Prairie over in East Arkansas is trying to save part of the Grand Prairie. Uh, there's another little prairie segment over there that's a natural area that's trying to save part of the Grand Prairie. It's only like 10 acres. Uh, uh, Flanagan and Cherokee together are about a thousand acres now. They've been able to expand the non-plowed portions uh, of the native natural prairies to, to about a thousand acres out. Uh, this would be north of Charleston, Arkansas on Highway 22, where this is about five miles north of Charleston. Uh, so it's a long way out there for us, but it, you know, if we can carpool, we, we're gonna get some great, great seed out there. This is one of our species we collected. Uh, this one is a uh, showy partridge pea. That's a beautiful flower. Uh, showy partridge pea. There's a seed of showy, showy partridge pea. Has about uh, 4,600 seeds per ounce, which is really huge, a huge wildflower seed. Here it is, uh, ready to collect. These are about to split open and start throwing their seeds everywhere, and that's how they disperse their seeds. Probably see some down here that have already split open. They have a little spring in the in the in the pod that, that, that springs apart when they dry, and uh, uh, they will throw their seed for yards, many yards. Okay, and some of the the uh, showy partridge piece, particularly. When our group collected at uh, Birdtown, uh, we found these beetle larvae growing in there, and I, I I dried those things for days, turned them over, and then I, then I took a uh, put them in a, a container, uh, a FedEx reinforced bag, and beat them with a a, a piece of hose uh, to free the seeds up, and then I then I would get to separate the seeds from the hulls. But uh, we found these, these, these dudes were still alive. Pretty gross, huh? I don't know which, what, what, what the beetles were. I never did find, never did look that up. I could probably find it on the internet what they were, but I didn't look it up. Okay, there we are harvesting that showy partridge pea. Uh, we've got uh, several of us there at Birdtown, uh, Kim, Carol, Don, Michael and Ed, Connie and Kathy were all there. So this, most of our crew were there harvesting uh, at Birdtown. The little ditch here, all along here were the showy partridge pea in great numbers. There's Michael at uh, Camp Robinson Special Use Area. We weren't collecting this species, but this is an illustration of, uh, of, uh, of a sunflower. I told you I really love sunflowers. And this is a swamp sunflower blooming in the fall there. Uh, we can see some associated wetland type grass uh, down here. Uh, there's probably some uh, Big blue stem blooming back here. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna give you a little quiz here. This children's campfire song, first published in 1899, was derived from an Amer African-American spiritual. The first one to name it in chat earns a two-winged silver bell tree. And I'll try to get this to you at one of our, uh, one of our uh, outdoor uh, experiences. Trees rare in Arkansas, only one county. 
After 20 years, mine has grown to about 15 feet high. Uh, this is two wing silver bell. More commonly in this part of Arkansas, we have the four wing silver bell. Uh, and it's fairly common. You see it uh, all along the, uh, the big piney creek. It's all along there. It's in the gravel bars. It's out in the washes out in the wooded areas. It's a beautiful tree. But this is two wing silver bell. It grows in South Arkansas in only one county. Now, I think this is my silver bell tree. It may be my snow bell. Uh, this actually may be the snow bell rather than the silver bell, but the snow bells and silver bells are very closely related. They're in the same family, Styracaceae. Uh, but this may be uh, American snow bell rather than silver bell. There's, this, is, this is silver bell. This is the silver bell flowers that you see in the spring. Bl it blooms in. Uh, Late April, early May, after after the just after the leaves come out, beautiful, beautiful tree. Okay, somebody's got to identify this song in chat here. Judy says, Kumbaya. I can't hear anything. Anybody else? Can you, can you not hear it? No, I can't hear a thing. I saw somebody else on chat. Can't hear anything else either. It's not. It's not. It's not actually transmitting the sound, then, is it? No, okay. Not for me and someone that. else up there. That's okay. Someone obviously heard it if they said "kumbaya," but uh, anyway. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'm. I'm gonna. I'm going to stop here a minute. It's, it's, it's about time to stop again. So we're just going to. So a lot of you couldn't hear that. Is that right? When we were out uh, looking for seed, we found a lot of these. They were all over the place in the prairie. And, and also I'm talking about road, roadside too. This is the yellow-legged garden spider. You, you, you've all seen this, you know. Now this is this is interesting because we have the, both the male and the female. The male's much smaller. He has a thinner abdomen. Uh, and here's the female, and obviously they're on a wildflower. And this particular wildflower is pale purple coneflower. These are pale purple coneflowers that they're building a nest on, building building a web on. Uh, so there's the male and the female of the yellow-legged garden spider. Real common. Uh, native spider. It's, it's not poisonous. Uh, it's harmless. It's really big, so it's pretty scary when you, when you see it. And uh, if you like me, spiders and snakes always tend to alarm me a little bit. I guess just from you know that what you, you as you grow up as a kid, you know you're afraid of those things. But uh, beautiful spider. You know I've never been one to want to hold spiders and stuff like that, but I've gotten a little bit braver over the years that I can I can get one in my hands now. Larry? Yeah. Can you go back to full screen? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, much better. Thank you. Yellow-legged garden spider on pale purple coneflower. I found, I found a unique place for pale purple coneflower where I found it, and I, I, I've been seeing it. If you drive down Highway 27 uh, uh, and you're driving by the, the uh, uh, Chambers golf course down there, you know, uh, Chambers is uh, 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 the guy that owns the Dallas Cowboys father-in-law, 
and uh, they built a big golf course down there. They got Jerry Jones' father-in-law. They built a big golf course down there, and and uh, there's a road cut there. This this uh, uh, has these pale purple coneflowers all over that road cut on the uh, west side, and there's probably you know 500 seed heads there, and uh, uh, every year, and I've been I've been seeing it there for 30 years, so I know it's just native endemic, you know, native uh, uh, pale purple coneflower. And uh, so I collected a lot of those seeds, heads off that for my own personal collection off that road cut there on Highway 27. Now this is the same spider, yellow-legged garden spider. And he has this neat little thing called a stabilimentum in his web. Now he's an orb weaver. And he builds this little, this little zigzag uh, uh, zipper into his his web. And they debated about what this zipper meant. And finally, they decided that it's it's a warning to birds that so the birds will see his web and a bird won't fly through his web. And that's that's, that's ultimately what appears most people have decided about. The yellow legged garden spider is this stabilimentum is so the birds will see the web and will not fly through it. Now, this is a uh, goldenrod, probably uh, old field goldenrod, I'm not sure, but this is one of the common shorter goldenrods, probably old field, I, I, but I'm not sure. Now, I, I told you I really like these, I really like sunflowers. The native sunflowers. They're absolutely wonderful garden flower. Here's two species of them right together. This is unusual. This one on the left here is, is, is blooming. Uh, uh, it is um, uh, called Ozark sunflower, also called rosinweed sunflower. It is opposed to rosinweed. It's not rosinweed, it's rosinweed sunflower but most places call it Ozark sunflower. So I like to call it Ozark sunflower to distinguish it from rosinweed, but it's called rosinweed sunflower because the flowers look like rosinweed, the stalk looks like rosinweed, but the leaves do not. And the leaves are beautiful, they're, they're shiny, they're large, uh, they're dark green, large leaves. Now it's, uh, uh, that's stuff. It's next to swamp sunflower. Now, probably this tends to grow in very dry areas. You see the dry hillside up here is extremely dry. Swamp sunflower tends to grow in ditches. Probably this is the apex of the ditch right here. So uh, we're right by the road. I'm probably I'm standing on the road taking this picture. Uh, this the swamp sunflower is in the wet area, and this one's on the edge of the hillside in the dry area uh, because this one likes dry. This one likes wet. But here in this kind of environment, they're right together. And you see they're beautiful sunflowers. Uh, this one typically gets to about uh, four, uh, three, well, three to, three to five feet tall. Uh, uh, this one, uh, uh, swamp sunflower, narrowly sunflower, is called swamp sunflower too. So they, they both got two names. <laughs> to confuse you even more, this is narrowly sunflower. Uh, it's a gorgeous sunflower. It can be between four and eight feet tall. So it's, it's taller generally than the, 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 the Ozark sunflower. But they're both wonderful sunflowers. And I collected seed on both of them this, this, this last year. This is, this is just south of the Booker Hollow store. Uh, about, uh, well, actually, this is probably closer to Max Pines. This is, this is right near Max Pines, which are both south of the Booker, Booker, Booker Hollow store, but it's close to Max Pines. You see both species there together. This is another species of, of sunflower called woodland sunflower. It's common. Uh, it grows at the wood, the edge of the woods, and you see it uh, at the edge of the woods. Now, interestingly, I saw this same species, or very closer. That's three of those woodland sunflower species. Species. I'm not sure which this one is, but there are three of them. I saw it growing out of the middle of the uh, of the prairie. At Camp Robinson Special Use Area, out in the sun, it was not adjacent to the trees. It was mixed in with the uh, uh, flora of, of of the open prairie 
which was interesting, interesting to me because I'd never seen it that way before. Now there's a seed heads. We saw this earlier blooming. Uh, this is narrow leaf mountain mint. It's the white flower with it, suffused with the little purple dots. We saw it blooming earlier. Uh, this is it mature and ready to pick, ready to harvest. It has 378,000 seeds per ounce. So we leave that in the seed heads and we let the lady at the nursery hammer mill those and get them out. Uh, there's no way we want to work to try to get those tiny seeds out of those out of those seed heads. And that's what we do with a lot of our plants, go to the hammer mill at the nursery. Uh, Black eyed Susan goes to the hammer mill at the nursery uh, intact. We dry them out and send them seed head intact. This one, uh, uh, the bee, bee balm goes seed head intact. And uh, but several of them I have to take out of the seed heads, but a lot of them I don't. And that, that's to my advantage, obviously. I have to take them out. That's a huge job to get out of seed heads. Okay. This is John Ironweed now. There are three different common species of ironweeds that look similar. And this was often confusing for us. Uh, but we decided we knew what our John Ironweed was. And it's the latest ironweed that blooms. It is giant. It is uh, a minimum four feet tall and sometimes seven or eight feet tall. You find it in wet ditches. You don't find it very often, but where you do find it, you'll, you'll find a lot of it frequently. Uh, just south of Dardanelle, it's growing the ditches down there, right next to where we found a huge bunch of shoy partridge peat. So this is, this is giant ironweed. And giant ironweed uh, is, is beginning to mature. Uh, these seeds are not ready, the, the pappas is not showing. Uh, not only does it the pappas have to show, but the pappas has to be open and the seed capsule open to harvest seeds the way we want to harvest them. We want to harvest them in the field. Uh, we made the mistake of bringing them home and that was an immense job. If you bring them home and try to, try to get, get, them, get, them, uh, get the seed out of the seed head. Just do it in the field, but wait till the plants mature properly. Now this is giant ironweed seeds. They're not real small, they're not large. Okay, we collected just some giant ironweed that day. Uh, here we got Connie and Jenny. Uh, Connie's here with us today. Uh, Jenny, I don't believe is with us today. This is Camp Robinson Special Use Area. This is an open prairie at uh, Camp Robinson Special Use Area. Uh, there's, a, there's a lake back here. And there's a lot of moisture uh, back here. And that's where we found giant ironweed down toward the lake. Uh, we also found bone set down there as well. Those are two real moist condition plants. Here, we were mainly collecting, uh, on that day, we were mainly collecting uh, narrowly mountain mint. Okay. I can't mention frost flowers because I think this is interesting. We have two native plants that produce frost flowers. I got up in the morning and I took these pictures because I've got for, I've got frost flowers on the property. White crown beard is one of them. The other is Dittany. Dittany produces frost flowers too. Now, how are frost flowers produced? Okay, looks like cotton candy, doesn't it? Okay. Well, these plants, these two species, Dittany, they're not even related. One is a as an aster family. One's a mint family. Dittany's a mint. This is an aster family. Uh, after these plants die back for the winter, their roots are still active. And on cold mornings, the roots produce water out of the roots, fluid out of the roots, sap out of the roots. And as it comes out, it freezes and draws more moisture out. And it makes these wonderful frost flowers. And that's what a frost flower is. So you're going to be white crown beard or dittany in Arkansas because those are the only two species that I'm aware of that make frost flowers. But there's, you've heard of frost flowers, that's a frost flower. Here's another one. Sometimes they're different shapes, but they kind of like cotton candy. And you, you can see uh, uh, striations in them where they came out of the roots, where the moisture came out of the roots. There's yet another frost flower. Almost looks like cotton candy, doesn't it? 
anyway. But that's that's a good good native uh, wildflower. That the one that makes the cross the white crowns beard is real important bee pollinator uh, for bee pollen bee, bees as far as a, uh, a nectar source. Now we talked about rosin weed sunflower a minute ago. This is rosin weed here. Okay. This is actually rosin weed. Now. This particular group of flowers are different from the usual composites. You know, I said something about the, the disc flowers and the ray flowers. Well, the disc flowers in this species are sterile. They just produce uh, uh, you know, anthers and stamen. They do not produce female parts. It's the ray flowers on the edge that, that, that have the, 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 the uh, uh, female parts. So all your seed on this in this disc when it matures are going to be at the edge because that's where the ray flowers were. This is rosin weed. And compass plant is another rosin weed in that same group. Compass plant is the same species, you know, silphium. And cup plant, cup plant is in that. And then there's uh, uh, a couple more uh, species in Arkansas that are native prairie plants that, that are in that genus as well. But, but Compass plant and cup plant are probably most likely known by you guys. And then you wouldn't know rosin weed generally. Uh, but there's a couple of species of, of rosin weed uh, as well uh, as cup plant and compass plant. And a couple of others in that same sylphium genus. It, it, they all have uh, fertile ray flowers and sterile disc flowers. Yeah, fertile ray flowers and sterile disc flowers. Notice it's really hairy, opposite leaves. Here it is again. You notice it doesn't have a lot of ray flowers, uh, uh, but they, they are fertile. Here's the leaves. And this plant looks a lot like it, doesn't it? Really hairy. Notice something different. This one's got a whole lot more petals. Look at all the ray, the, the, the ray flowers here. Many more ray flowers. Than, in this one. This is rosin weed. And this one is actually a sunflower. This is ashy sunflower. It's called ashy sunflower because it has, it looks kind of gray from all the hairs on the leaves. But the leaves look very similar to this species. Very hairy. Uh, but fortunately, they bloom about a month apart. Uh, this one blooms first, and this one blooms last. In fact, this one in my meadow was present for the uh, fall monarch uh, uh, migration, and I saw them feeding on this flower in the meadow. So ashy sunflower and rosin weed. Not rosin weed sunflower, but what rosin weed? I'm getting you real confused, aren't I? Ashy sunflower is a really nice flower to have in your garden. Uh, it makes a really nice Really nice addition to the wildflower garden. I highly recommend it. This is a species I wouldn't necessarily recommend for your wild, wildflower garden, but it's interesting. Uh, this is common evening primrose. This is uh, one of our uh, collection specimens we collected. We found it in three different sites uh, this year. Uh, we got, we submitted quite a few seed of this. Uh, this plant is nearly mature, it's flowered already. It has typical evening primrose yellow flowers. I don't, most of you are probably familiar with evening primrose and the, the, the yellow flowers it has. Well, it has typical flowers, but the plant's so big, the flowers look real small. This plant is eight feet high. And uh, uh, these are not quite mature. They're beginning to mature down here. They're beginning to turn, but they'll turn brown and they're ready to harvest uh, when they turn brown. And that is common evening primrose, and it's one of the plants that we were able to collect for Project Wingspan this year. Okay. And we talked about the prairies in the River Valley, and even at Camp Robinson, they have prairie remnants still there that, that, that are still present. And, you know, there may be a prairie pimple mound right there. Okay. But this is Camp Robinson in early spring, and uh, uh, th it has a flower that does not grow out in the western prairies, but, but it's common here. And we can see some. Uh, yeah, well, anyway, this plant uh, is called Arkansas sneezeweed in this uh, Helenium 
Capestry, I believe. Yeah. Uh, but that's Arkansas sneezeweed. And it's got one another one, another one of those endemic Arkansas species, Arkansas sneezeweed. And it's an early bloomer. It blooms uh, in uh, probably in, in late April, early May. Okay. Now, okay. And we talked about the hard pan. We talked about where the hard grass, the, the, the tall grass prairie was in Arkansas. In the many places it used to be, and uh, where some remnants still are. This is one of the common uh, plants of the tall grass prairie in Arkansas. It's called switchgrass. Uh, it's a tall plant. It gets up to uh, four to six feet tall. Uh, it's got it's a wide leafed uh, native plant. Uh, uh, that's switchgrass. And that was this picture was taken at Camp Robinson Special Use Area. Uh, I've got a, a, a uh, I've seen a video that Arkansas Audubon produces of their little uh, prairie area, and it's really prominent there too, switchgrass. It likes moist places. It, li it likes moisture. This is one that does not like moisture. This is little blue stem, and a little blue stem is a, uh, uh, one of those uh, uh, anchors of the tall grass prairie as well. It's, it's shorter than big blue stem or Indian grass, uh, but it's a beautiful grass. And this is the fall. See, it turns a nice uh, red color in the fall, little blue stem. This is big blue stem, another anchor of the prairie, OK? You can see it's also called turkey foot because of these the inflorescence and the sea heads uh, that present. Uh, sometimes they're, they're three, three portions, so it's called turkey foot. Uh, turkey foot grass, big blue stem. Now we've seen this wildflower here before. This is uh, a swamp uh, sunflower again, okay? Uh, there could be some Bidens in there with it, but I think mainly it's, it's a swamp sunflower. They're shorter here in the prairie than they would be in a wet ditch someplace. But that, that is swamp sunflower. In the prairie, the forbs, which are the, the flowering plants, way outnumber the grasses, typical prairie. 80% of the biomass is gonna be forbs, and only about 20% grasses. So the, 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 the prairie has a lot more forbs, flowering plants than it has grasses. This is Indian grass. This is an, another, here's another, this is this typical flowering head of Indian grass. And this is the Indian grass, at Flanagan, okay. You, you don't see the Indian grass necessarily with the big big blue stem. They can be together. Big blue stem likes more moisture. Indian grass tolerates quite a bit of moisture or quite dry. Whereas little blue stem wants it pretty dry. Little blue stem is common on glade, barrens and glades in Arkansas and in, 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 in forest areas where the soil is very thin. Uh, it, it'll tolerate extreme, extremely dry conditions. Little blue stem will. Any grass is more flexible. Big blue stem is more wet. Switchgrass is a wet, pretty wet soil. Okay, these this, these pictures came from the ANHC. Uh, we saw some of this earlier. Uh, th th this is uh, this is uh, uh, Cherokee. Okay, and we can see the prairie pimple mounds out here. Uh, we see. Uh, pale purple coneflower, and we see rough coneflower. Now, rough coneflower is a black-eyed Susan, pale purple coneflower is a coneflower. The grasses are not blooming yet, so we won't see them. Uh, they're not out yet. This is a rough and a pale purple coneflower together. There's a little insect. This is rough coneflower. In the back here is prairie gay feather. And prairie gay feather is the is a Leatrice that blooms. Now we we were not we, we did not collect prairie gay feather. I collected for myself because I found some over near Charleston on, on the or over near uh, Paris on the highway and, and I found it also on the southern south. So I, I see it in the in, in my pasture here. Prairie gay feather. There's more prairie gay feather. This is yellow wild indigo. Uh, 
we have several species of wild indigo in Arkansas. We have white, yellow, creamy. We have two creamy wild indigos. We have, we have, we have a couple of white indigos. We got one yellow indigo. We got one blue indigo. The blue indigo doesn't live in the, it lives in the Ozarks. It does not live down here in the River Valley. So we don't have the blue, unfortunately. We have the, we have a couple of whites. We have, we have this one in the River Valley. Uh, we have uh, uh, one of the, we have creamy wild indigo here. And then there's another creamy wild, creamy or uh, whitish wild indigo that grows exclusively in the Washita. It's just endemic there. Uh, in the Washita. This is more uh, a rough coneflower prairie. This is Baker's Prairie. Okay, now Baker's Prairie is different from Cherokee and Flanagan because it's on limestone. It's one of those that are, that are, that are that's got limestone in it. So a little, little more alkaline soil. Uh, 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 it has a, a limestone hard pen under it. Breakers Prairie at one time was 5,000 acres uh, in size. But now the, the only remnant left there is, is the edge of Harrison. Uh, it, it's, it is part of a natural area. You can go see it, you can visit it. It has trails through it. Uh, it's pale purple. This is uh, a little uh, poppy mallow. This is poppy mallow. This is uh, uh, rattlesnake master. Uh, these tall things here are compass plant and they're blooming. You see the yellow blooms of the compass plant. Compass plant again, uh, pale purple coneflower, rattlesnake master here. There's the Taylor Road digitata, the little uh, 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 poppy mallow. Okay. This is a great black wasp. Now, we talked about uh, pollinators a lot. This is a pollinator, the male form of this. The female form, uh, uh, this is larger and she's a katydid killer, okay? So if you've ever seen a big katydid killer, uh, you know, with a katydid or a grasshopper dragging it along, that's the female form of this one. The male form feeds on pollen. And here he is, and he, he, he therefore is a pollinator. Uh, he's not like a bee. He doesn't have a lot of fur that carries around pollen, but he, 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 can, he can pollinate the plants himself, self-pollinate the plants. He'll, he'll aid in the self-pollination. So this is a great black wasp. Uh, also, the female form is called a cookie dip killer. And this is on uh, 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 Rattlesnake Master, again, beautiful plant, Rat Rattlesnake Master. It, it offers a contrast in the garden. This is one that you see on the prairie. Now, this particular picture not on the prairie, but I've seen it on the prairie, in the prairie many times. It's all over Flanagan and, and scattered all over Flanagan and, and uh, uh, also over Cherokee. This is a sensitive briar, and uh, it has these little mimosa flowers. It's, it's called mimosa metallic, named after Nuttall, who was one of our great uh, plant explorers. Uh, Nuttall uh, came uh, through in the early 1800s. And he described a lot of uh, Arkansas country, uh, and he na he named a lot of plants. And this is this is Mota, Mosa Natale, named after Nuttall. Uh, and this particular plant grows on Mount Magazine about a third of the way up, and I've seen it every year. It comes out and blooms. It's a pretty plant, sensitive briar, and it is a briar, so it will it will grab you. It does have, but it's in, in the Mosa family, in the bean family. There's a close-up of the flowers, just typical most of that flowers. Okay, button bush. This is one of our species we collected for Project Wingspan. It's a great source of, of, of pollen and nectar for pollinators. Uh, this is an American lady butterfly. Uh, larva, this butterfly grows on pussy toes and related, related species. But, so if you see pussy toes growing, you can always think about American lady butterfly. Uh, this is American lady butterfly on button bush. Button bush is a swamp plant. It grows right at the edge of ponds. It can grow in water. It can grow in up to three feet of water. This is from our pond here at the house. 
we collected about five pounds, four, four to five pounds of button bush seeds. Now, after they dried, they weren't that much, but I'd put put them put them on the table and dry them for a few days, and I shipped them. But uh, this is this is button bush. This is Meta Beauty. It's a common wetland indicator. A beautiful plant. If you got a wet place, you can grow that. Meta Beauty. Uh, you've seen that before. That's that's fox glove tongue. This is a this is one that we can confuse with white, but uh, white. Uh, I mean, with uh, fox glove beard tongue. This is called white one beard tongue. There are eight species of beard tongue in Arkansas. This one grows in similar habitats, boris ditches. It's about a week later, but sometimes they overlap in blooming. Uh, it does not have that dilated corella portion here. It's narrow. It's called white wand beard tongue. Okay, we were out sowing wildflowers in mid-December and land we prepared here. We see 1.6 acres of wildflowers. <clears throat> now, you don't have to have any kind of machine like this. All you have to have to uh, prepare the soil is you've got to kill the existing non-native grasses. Unfortunately, pastures have enormous numbers of non-native grasses. The non-native grasses I have on this property here are, uh, I have uh, Johnson grass, I have uh, uh, Bahia and Bermuda, common Bermuda, all from Africa. All three of those species are African origin. And then I have the European origin, tall fescue. And they all will compete enormously with your native plants. You got to get rid of them. And the only way you can get rid of them is, is, is to use herbicides. Or if you've got a small plant, part, part like this little piece here, I actually bought 2,000 square feet of, of plastic. You can use clear plastic and put down, and it will kill everything under it. If you put it on in June and you leave it until November, it will kill the seeds that are in the soil, the seed repository in the soil. It'll kill all the, the, uh, the uh, uh, foreign grasses. Uh, it, it'll kill essentially everything if you leave it long enough. It's got to be clear plastic. It can't be black plastic, it can't be white plastic. It's got to be clear. It will work. Temperatures will reach 150 to 160 degrees in the soil, the first two or three inches of soil on a warm day. And that will kill all those foreign seeds. So all you have to have is something to kill the soil, kill, kill the uh, seeds in the soil. You can do it also by spraying Roundup. You have to spray it about three times. Spray early, mid-season, late season, kill all the things that are coming up. You can do it with Roundup. Especially if you have a large area, you obviously couldn't put, you know, over two or three acres, you couldn't put, you know, uh, plastic. But if you've got a small area, you know, a thousand square feet or less, probably, you can use the clear plastic real well. And it's got to be sealed at the edges. You've got to put uh, either bricks right edge to edge over the edge or put uh, uh, dirt over the edge to seal that edge so that the air will not get under it. It's got to keep the heat under it. Uh, but uh, so when you plant your wildflowers, you don't even need anything like this to, to, to get them in contact with soil. Generally, uh, when you put the seed out and you can mix them with sand and spread them out by hand, more sand, spread them out. You can wait for the rains and a frost. The frost heaving will get the seeds to the proper depth to come up. So all you need is a clean place. You need seed. You need to be able to distribute the seed and you need the weather to take care of the rest of it. And you can get plenty of wildflower seed out of the way. This is some of the wildflower seed I collected coming up. This was about 10 days ago, two weeks ago. This is a real simple homemade rig. These are two old screens from old windows we used to have years ago. I saved the screens for this kind of you know, potential purpose. And you see that keeps the leaves off of them. It keeps the hard rain, it breaks up the hard rain that's going to hit them. Uh, it keeps the animals from eating the seed. Uh, th these are old gutter screens that used to be on the gutter a long time ago. We had to replace them with better quality uh, gutter screens. But I saved some of these to place around to keep the 
you know, they keep the animals out from the seed. These seed are coming up. Uh, this is compass plant here. We saw the tall compass plant in the prairie. Uh, it has a big seed, so you can see big cotyledons. These are all at the first stage where the cotyledons are showing, but the, but the first leaves are not showing. This one is showing the first leaves. So this one's gone now because I've taken it to the greenhouse and potted it out. I have 18 now, 18 specimens of, of uh, tall Coreopsis. It's a midsummer, midsummer blooming Coreopsis is beautiful. The compass plants, when they get their first leaves, I'll separate them out and put them out in individual pots. It's, it's, it's a chore, it's hard, it's, it's tedious, you know. Look at all these uh, uh, swamp sunflowers. I gotta separate those out, you know, when they get their first true leaves. It's just a matter of taking that thing out of there, pulling it all apart, trying to get the, try not to break the little plant and, and, and while well, you stick it inside. And, and you guys have most mostly have done this kind of thing, but you know, it, it just it's a lot of work, you know, it's just a lot of work. But I've got probably 12 or 14 species of uh, there, there's cone flowers here, there's there's there, there's purple cone flower, pale purple cone flower. There's a uh, rough cone flower over here. Uh, uh, this is a rattlesnake master over here. Uh, this one is the, the, the uh, sweet cone flower that I told you about I really like over here. Uh, this is uh, rosin weed, regular rosin weed. And there's rosin weed sunflower here too. Rosin weed sunflower. So I got, got a bunch of stuff. This is a close up uh, of the uh, of the compass plant coming out. You see big old seeds. In fact, there's a seed, there's a seed right there. So and uh, so they have big old cotyledons. This is the uh, uh, the uh, swamp sunflower I was talking about. This is a pale purple no purple cone flower. Okay, I just got a couple more slides here. Uh, this is winter in Arkansas. Obviously, we had this period, and winter is an active time, and uh, a lot of things are growing in the winter. This is alder, and it's alders fruiting and fertilizing in the winter. Uh, this is the male catkins of alder. These are the little female cones. These are last year's cones here scattered about. You can see a few of them. Uh, you know, alder has a little cone like structure, uh, but, but, uh, you know, things are going on in the winter. And, uh, the alder is being fertilized in, in, in the pond here uh, in front of the house. This is Ozark witch hazel. It's blooming in February. It was nine degrees below zero that morning. But the blooms are there. Now, the blooms are curled up because of the cold. They kind of pulled them in and curled up. Here's what uh, Ozark witch hazel looks like normally. This would be typical February bloom of Ozark witch hazel. How do these plants get fertilized? I mean, Clearly, it has a fragrance, it has a flower. What fertilizes Ozark witch hazel? What flies about in these cold temperatures? You know, it, and the same thing with fall witch hazel, which is, which is uh, Virginia witch hazel. See, we've got two species of witch hazel marks. We've got fall witch hazel and we've got spring witch hazel. <laughs> spring witch hazel is also called Ozark witch hazel, which is confusion more, but. And 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 in fall witch hazel is called Virginia witch hazel. But anyway, we've got two species of witch hazel, and they're both they both are fertilized in, in seed start and they bloom and they're fertilized in the winter. Okay, in the winter. Okay, there's what fertilizes spring witch hazel and fall witch hazel. It's a shivering moth. Okay, what's a shivering moth? Well, it's a type of cutworm moth. So there's, there's, there's about, there's many species and many genera of cutworm moths. They're basically subterranean larvae that, that, that feed on your tomato plants, right? Or your pepper plants, they cut them down. Well, one, one a, couple of, uh, a couple of genera are shivering moths. They're active in the winter. And the way they create body heat to fly is in the evening, <clears throat> they'll start shivering. And they've got this coat, you see, of lots of hairs. And their body temperature can warm up by as much as 50 degrees from them shivering. 
And then when they start flying, they create more heat and are able to continue flying. And they fertilize the witch hazels. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, I don't, I've got a few more minutes. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about Project Wingspan, you know, I collected. This is one thing I, I'm gonna talk about here is real quick is you gotta have protection, you know. Uh, I've been gardening all my life. Uh, I've been an outdoor person, I've ridden a bicycle. 130,000 miles. Uh, so I've had a lot of sun exposure and uh, I'm working on my four skin cancer now. I've had, I've had one on my face, uh, one on my elbow, uh, one on my shoulder, and now I've got one on my ear. I've got to go in and have this one on the ear uh, uh, operated on uh, in the next couple of weeks. And, you know, it's, it's, it's minor surgery, but it has to be done with plastic surgeon available. So I got to go north a lot to have that done. So it's a hassle, you know, to have to fool with these things. They're not going to kill you. They're just going to disfigure you, but they're not going to kill you. But the way you prevent them is wear an adequate hat. And, and, and this, this hat will keep you cool, keep your whole body cool. It's so big, it's got like a six inch brim. It'll keep your whole body cool. So I, I, I'm glad I invested in this hat. And uh, you really need protection from the sun. And, and you probably need to use a sunscreen as well. Uh, I, I, I've been bad about not using sunscreen, but uh, uh, you need it. You need to protect yourself. Okay, I was going to talk a little bit about Project Wingspan. I'm going to uh, have to stop sharing and then share again to get my thing to come up. Okay, this is Project Wingspan site and uh, pollinator.org slash wingspan. That's how you get there. Pollinator.org slash wingspan. And uh, can you, I guess you all can see that. Uh, it's, a, it's a great site. They tell you about, you know, seed collection training. That's the section you go to. You, you've, got, you've got to take some, some videos. You've got to do typically, I think, a couple of videos for the collectors and four or five videos for the for the lead seed collector. Lead seed collectors are obviously a, a big, bigger responsibility. Uh, they have the forms you need to do to fill it out, but this is how you get certified for collection for Project Wingspan. Again, Project Wingspan is a three-year landscape scale project supported by grants from the National Fish and Wildlife Federation to the nonprofit, the Pollinator Partnership. Working with a coalition of partners and dedicated volunteers to increase the quality, quantity, and connectivity of pollinator habitat across the Midwest and Great Lakes region to support imperiled native pollinators and the vital habitat they depend on. So basically, we collect uh, ecotype seed. Okay, we want seed from just this ecotype. We don't want we don't want contaminated seed that that's been from come from Illinois or Indiana or Oklahoma. We want Arkansas seed. We want Arkansas seed in our region, okay? We're in the orange region, which contains the River Valley, uh, all the way from Little Rock to Fort Smith. We have 15 counties we collect in. We want those seed to be from genetically from this area, and we want them to, to be planted back in this area to keep the genetics uh, appropriate for the area. And that's, that's our goal with Project Wingspan. Okay, I appreciate you guys uh, staying for nearly three hours. Uh, I, I guess 